What's going up, everybody? And thank you so much for tuning in. So today I am joined by author Stephen Erickson, uh, as you know, of the Malazan world. But uh, Stephen, how are you doing today? I'm doing OK. Uh, it's finally gotten cold here. So that, that's I mean, my wife likes that, but I'm kind of miserable about it. So I, I like the warmth, you know, um, you're down in Florida, aren't you? So, so, so I'm in Alabama, cl close to Alabama. Enough, we'll, yeah, yeah, we'll, close be, we'll be going to Florida here soon, which it'll be even warmer than it already yeah. is here. So, I'm, I'm a fan of, of uh, that kind of warmth for sure. So, I'm curious that, you know, we talked a little bit off air, but, you know, you come to Orlando or try to come to Orlando, you know, once once a year for a conference. And I'm curious mm -hmm. if, if you like the warmth so much, you know, why not? Why don't you move? I know you're up in, in Canada, so it's it's generally pretty cold there, especially around this time. Well, of year. no, I'm on the West Coast, which is, okay. the, you know, the um, similar to Seattle, but less rain. Gotcha. <clears throat> so. Um, and in the summers, I tend to. Uh, head east and when I can and um, get out onto the prairie, which is sort of where my, my, my soul lies. Um, and that's something that I, I don't think I'd want to give up on, uh, not to mention the healthcare. So <laughs> yeah, we won't get into that. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd throw that one out there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, so I know you kind of, you kind of work in, I guess two personas. You know, you, you've got your your Steven Erickson that you write under, uh, which is your pen name. Uh, so, where did that pen name come from? And would you say that you have a different persona as Erickson versus London? Oh yeah, absolutely. You have to. I mean, uh, the Erickson persona is a, is a professional, um, and um, Steve London is is a rank amateur. So you know, it, it, there's a huge difference between the two. Um, I didn't choose, uh, I wasn't planning on, on a, a pseudonym, but I was living in England and my first publishers were publishing a contemporary fiction novel, a uh, coming of age novel. And so that was my first book out there. And then when Gardens of the Moon got picked up um, with a different publisher, those first publishers contacted my agent and said, well, we'd rather he used uh, a pen name because you know fantasy is is kind of lowbrow rubbish stuff and we're interested in the, in, in promoting Steve Steve as a, uh, a I, I don't know highbrow literary writer and um, so we thought okay, whatever um, and so I chose my my uh, late mother's uh, maiden name which was Erickson dropped one of the K's I think there were two or two S's actually so I dropped one S and uh, stayed with that. Um, sort of an add on to all of that is, is the first publishers came back maybe two years later and said, well, we kind of changed our minds on this and we said it was too late. So, yeah. It's kind of like, well, he's doing so well. So maybe we should, maybe we should rethink this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cause the, cause gardens did quite well. So. It's interesting. I wonder when did that, I guess that stigma start and end with the, with the whole like fantasy is, is kind of like a rubbish thing. Like, Oh, no, nobody reads it or only certain types of people read it. Cause I feel like, you know, it's just gotten so big that it can't be, yeah. but you know, yeah. I, I talk to people, especially in the South and I go, yeah, I read fantasy. They're like, Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. I don't know what it is about it, but I'm like, do you watch movies? There's a lot of fantasy in movies. I don't know if you realize that. <laughs> I know. I know. I, I mean, I couldn't tell you where it started. Um, it's been there for a long time. It, it, it's been there uh, as part of the denigration of, of any populist or popular uh, genre. Mm -hmm. um, so there was always sort of this push for um, establishing a kind of elite standard um, for literature. And um, that was a self-defining process that, you know, probably had to do with, universities and, and critics and people in you know magazines like the new yorker or whatever um that basically set out to define what what serious literature was mm -hmm. and um primarily they defined it as the stuff they read yeah and uh and that's that kind of closed the door on, on uh, a lot of uh very very good literature that just happens to be within a genre that these people don't read mm -hmm. It's like it's like serious literature versus silly literature. <laughs> I guess. Well, I I, I don't know. 
not silly, but frivolous, I guess, mm. would be the attitude towards it. Um, so even the idea that something uh, like horror or science fiction or um, fantasy can actually uh, explore aspects of the human condition in ways that other genres can't mm. just seems to be lost on them. But it's all down to, you know, what, what a person reads. Um, and then um, the desire to elevate uh, the stuff they like uh, over mm -hmm. everything else. But we all do that. So, you know, that's not too surprising. Right. It's, just, it's become, you know, sort of um, fixated, um, I guess, uh, a, a kind of gatekeeping. You know, mm -hmm. we're just, and, you know, it was very much the case here in Canada, too. You had what's called Can Lit, which was serious Canadian literature. Um, and as a consequence, you know, the Can Lit conferences and festivals uh, just don't see science fiction and fantasy or horror authors uh, invited. Mm -hmm. It's very rare anyways. Um, to this day, I've yet to be invited to uh, this, my home, my home city's um, International Writers Festival. It just, it just never happened. Um, no phone calls. No. <laughs> just something about that yeah <laughs> and then you get invited and you turn them down you're like nah i'm too good <laughs> <laughs> well no, no i'd love to go i'd love to go mm. it's great to talk to talk uh, writing with you know i read all kinds of genres um including contemporary fiction so mm. um you know it, it'd be a lot of fun but um it just doesn't happen so. yeah yeah i'm curious you know uh i always you know you're always told like read what you write uh, and so, I, you know, I hear a lot of fantasy writers like just reading fantasy, they'll read a little bit of like science fiction or other genres. You know, would, would you say that, you know, that whole like write what you know or write what you read is should be a thing or should you do you feel you, they should you should read everything and yeah, it's take not, bits it's and not, pieces from everywhere? Yeah, it's not my experience at all. Um, what you just said. Um, I, I actually years ago I was in Winnipeg and um, I was already writing the fantasy, the Malazan stuff. And I wrote a, a, a short um, contemporary novel uh, about hockey of all things and the loss of the original Winnipeg Jets mm. uh, when the team left and went to uh, Arizona. And um, it's a kind of a stream of consciousness uh, romp through, through, uh, the history of Winnipeg. And so, you know, that you think about that and you're thinking, well, okay, I, if I'm going to target this to a publisher, it's not going to be a national publisher or an international publisher. It's, it's going to be local. So I went local and then there were nominations and there was a, a, an awards night. And so I actually got to, you know, attend one of these, these uh, can lit uh, events where they were going to hand out provincial awards. And, um, after about half an hour conversation with, with my fellow writers, the other nominees, I was struck by the fact that they follow the rule you just mentioned. They read mm -hmm. what they want to write. Um, and then I was thinking to all the times I'd been to the World Fantasy Convention or um, International Conference on the Fantastic and the Arts and World Cons and stuff. And when I talked to other fantasy authors and science fiction authors, they read everything. Mm. They read everything. Um, and, you know, they, they've gone through quite often um, in university or whatever. They, they've gone through English programs where you're reading the canon of literature, whatever that is. And um, so they, they're widely read. Um, and I can't really think of many fantasy authors who would ever say to me, oh, I just read fantasy. Mm -hmm. It does not happen. Um, so that was a big difference I noticed um, was that one group was um, self-regulating uh, the material they were reading and the other group was grabbing anything and everything they could get their hands on. Yeah. Very different mindset, I think. Right. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like, you know, I, I grew up reading different things and then I kind of set reading aside while I was in college. And then I kind of came back to it. <laughs> you set reading aside while you were in college. Yeah. Like <laughs> and, uh, and so then, you know, I, I got back into reading, you know, about, about five or six years ago, uh, like really actually like getting into it uh, and enjoying it again. And 
you know, I started out reading a little bit of science fiction. Then I kind of started reading a little more fantasy, but honestly, like I, I just kind of read anything that piques my interest now. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. And that's probably why I have like this enormous pile of books that I'll just never get through uh, because I just can't like, you know, there's no genre I can just pick and go. That's my favorite genre. Like I've got horror that I love thrillers that I love, uh, you know, fantasy and science fiction, of course. Uh, and, And, you know, I feel like being well read, would help me at some point if I decide to start writing, which I've, it's always been something I want to do. And just, mm-hmm. I always say that I don't have time to do it or, <laughs> you know, or I don't have the chops or whatever. So, um, so yeah, you know, I, I feel like that whole, you know, read what you write is great. And I think it would help, you know, influence certain aspects of your writing, but, you know, if you're missing out on certain other writers, like, a, you know, their craft and so forth, I feel like you might miss, your own voice somewhere in there like there's some things you can take from certain writers you might yeah um i pretty much have stopped reading fantasy um but my original sort of take on it was yes i'd grown up reading all this stuff Mm -hmm. i've been reading science fiction and like you say thrillers and, and all kinds of things um and i didn't want too much of a a notion of sort of preconceived ideas of what are the limitations to to the genre Mm -hmm. and if you're reading other works uh i mean you steal from everything you know when you're creating something and you know i can look at my novels and i can see elements of vietnam war literature i can see elements of tom clancy um i can see elements of uh robert ludlum you know writers out there just in other genres stephen Mm -hmm. king um but I mean, I can see elements of Alice Munro, you know, it's just, it's just weird things. Um, whatever you pick up and, and whatever you find useful, uh, you can then apply. So if you're just reading within your genre, um, unless you're reading really experimental stuff within that genre, um, I, I, I can see a risk of sort of um, being limited or trapped by the conventions of that genre. Mm-hmm. rather than breaking those conventions or challenging them or subverting them or um, seeing, seeing them in different ways and approaching them in different ways. Yeah. So, you know, if, you, know, if, you, if you, you were to read, I don't know, uh, The Hunt for Red October and then um, decided to write a fantasy novel set on the seas or under the seas or whatever, um, there's a lot in the structure of The Hunt for Red October that that is absolutely the ideal for, for the genre you're going to work in, mm-hmm. but it's never been done before. Yeah. And that's, that's the thing that should fire you up as a writer that, you know, you've not seen this before, but you'd like to see it. Mm-hmm. And so you go, you just set about and stoke a fire in the belly and, and start writing. Yeah. Okay. So um, I don't know what, what really struck a chord and got you started writing and then what really got you started writing seriously? Cause I know, People, people always say, oh, I've been writing for years, but like, what, what was it? When was it like, okay, I'm really going to sit down. I'm going to do this. I want to get, I want to publish something. I think um, it was two things. Uh, I was originally being sort of steered towards um, painting and illustration. And um, it started quite early um, in, in my schools um, where they sort of volunteered me for uh, extracurricular courses at the Winnipeg Art Gallery um, to do life drawings and that kind of stuff, which they couldn't do in, in the high school. Mm. And um, so that was the direction I was heading in. And I was a huge fan of um, Frank Rosetta's artwork, um, which of course primarily show up on um, fantasy novels. Uh, the early Lancer editions of Conan, for example, and Edgar Rice Burroughs when they were reissued by Ace um, and Ballantyne. Well, Ballantyne didn't do Frazetta, but Ace did. And that kind of artwork was just, I mean, it, it still is. It's phenomenal. It's the best covers you'll ever see. Um, it is fine art. Um, so I was wanting to head in that direction. And I was also thinking of um, doing comic books. Mm. And the problem was um, I was too slow and probably ultimately not good enough. Um, so I would be working like 
weeks on a single panel um, because you couldn't do it electronically. There were no computers back then. You had to do it all, all by hand and, and hand coloring as well, hand inking uh, the works. Um, and it was just so excruciatingly slow. Uh, and it was hard to sort of maintain your momentum uh, mm -hmm. doing the drudgery work. Um, and then I realized that, well, you know what? Actually, what really interests me is the narrative that, that's behind the things I'm drawing. And so it made sense to just drop the drawing side of things and stick with the narrative. And I sort of came to that realization in my early 20s. Um, I was at university uh, in studying archaeology, anthropology, that kind of stuff. But I, I'd always sort of make sure I had sort of at least one elective um, that was outside anything I was doing in, uh, in terms of uh, my majors and minors. And I ended up in a creative writing uh, class, which turned out to be the wrong class because he was specialized in poetry that, that year. Uh, so when I said I, I have this fantasy novel in mind, um, he just said, well, you don't have to come to class, just bring me what you've got um, every month or so, and we'll just monitor it that way. He had no idea what was coming because over the course of that, that year, he got a 700 page novel and he basically, and I was typing it out on a, an electric typewriter, um, which I've just been looking into. Um, they're kind of making a comeback and yeah. I'm really tempted. Um, the one I had was an, an Olympia report and it had a, a black ribbon on the top, the ink side, and then a whiteout. Remember whiteout? Yeah, oh yeah. Whiteout underneath it on the ribbon so you could correct as you typed and i just i adored that typewriter and i've been trying to track one down since and um they're kind of hard to find at the moment mm. but um so i wrote the whole thing on that and he just said well all right uh, i'll spend the summer and uh, edit it for you and go through it which was an extraordinary thing to do and he did, he did an amazing job um and at the end of it he um the end of that summer, uh, after I'd come back from a dig and stuff and talked to him, he just said, well, you know, I actually, I can see you being a science fiction or fantasy author. And I was really quite surprised by that because um, the book was rubbish. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> it, it's, it's the first thing you do, right? So you just write on uh, adrenaline and you go with it. But from there, I ended up um, dropping out of um, anthropology, um, my master's, and going into a writing program and there I was writing contemporary fiction I wasn't writing it was short stories um, and that's where I really sort of um, learned those aspects of narrative structure that I then applied to everything else and uh, have applied to everything else ever since mm. and so, I, I know I know every author says they have that one throwaway book and it's always the first one sometimes it's the first second or third one but just like the fact that you wrote 700 pages, I was like, yeah, it's throwing off. Well, I'm just like, oh gosh. <laughs> I just, yeah, it's it just long seems gone. like such a daunting task, you know? <laughs> I know, but, and that was the thing, that was the first lesson I, I, I learned about this because uh, I had done a short story on just a, kind of a lark uh, in a local contest. This is what preceded me writing the fantasy novel. And I think it, it got second place. Um, and, um, so the sense of sort of beginning something and completing it, um, it, it, it sort of, I didn't realize it at the time, but when I finished the 708 page novel, quarter million words, I guess, thereabouts, um, the most rewarding aspect of it was finishing. Mm. And um, you could see, I mean, if you were, and, this teacher and he was he could, he could track it through through the writing that i got better and better as I, as the novel got deeper in um and that's where the learning takes place the learning doesn't take place on the easy stuff the openings of uh, of a story or um the beginnings the first chapters the, you know you, you do that on adrenaline and excitement and it's a new setting and it's new characters and it gets you all fired up but then it starts turning into a grind and it starts getting hard. And that's when the learning takes place. Mm. So um, in a completely witless fashion, I, I sort of learned a lesson that um, 
I've, I've held on to ever since that. And it's the advice I give um, to writers is, to beginning writers is, finish what you start. There's nothing more important than finishing what you start. It doesn't matter if, the, if, if you know, you then, you know, burn it on a bonfire afterwards. It doesn't matter. You have finished because psychologically, that is the most daunting aspect of any project uh, that, that involves investing and committing that, you know, on something that may take a year or two years. Um, you, you have to be able to, to know that you can reach the end, that you can see the end goal that is there and you can reach it. Um, and that, that, that sort of gives you that, that slow burning fuel that you need to, to sustain yourself. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, short stories, it's a whole different beast because you can get those wrapped up in the night, you know? So um, the novel is, is a different, it's a different thing entirely. Yeah. And I feel like, you know, once you finish it, you can you know, feel that sense of accomplishment and you go, I wrote a book. It might not be good at all, but I, I freaking did it. You know, <laughs> you no, I mean, once you have to do it because once you, you can try to imagine that sense of accomplishment, but there's nothing like the, the actually experiencing it. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. It is the, the best high possible. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this so is but right. course, <laughs> good high shouldn't last. Right. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, um, because then self-doubt will creep in and all the rest, but at least mm. you, you, at least you completed it. And when you sit down to start the next book, well, you've got, you got that template of that experience behind you and it makes it uh, that much more um, internally motivated, internally mm. driven. I gotcha. How would you say that your writing has not just changed, but, or maybe how have you had changed as a writer since that first, you know, 708 page, you know, draft in, in college to now, like, you know, has your writing process changed? Has it stayed somewhat similar? Um, you know, and, and have you really found your groove as far as like, okay, when I sit down, I know I've got to do, you know, do you do a word count per day or per week? No, no. Um, the process changes, um, but it changes due to external circumstances. Yeah. Um, so, you know, as, as a student, um, both in, here in Victoria, University of Victoria, and then the masters in, in Iowa, um, I would write at night. I'd start around 10 p.m. and I'd finish at 3 a.m., you know, but I, I was, you know, living there on my own in a flat or whatever. Um, or sharing a flat with other writers and it didn't matter what, what hours we kept. Mm -hmm. um, so I was very much a nocturnal writer, but then you get married, you have kids and no, I, that ain't working. No. <laughs> so you got to <laughs> shift it. And um, so I learned to be a daytime writer, um, mm -hmm. which was difficult because normally, you know, you're having to work. So you're going to nine to five. So I became a lunch, a lunch break writer, you know, and then at the end of the day I would write. And then uh, um, I'd go down to uh, the pub when I was living in the UK and I'd write. Um, or you get a grant and that gives you the freedom to, you know, to basically not have to do any, any, other, any other kind of work. And you can just work on, on your stories or your novels. Um, and writing programs give you that permission as well. Mm -hmm. um, you're there to write, so that's what you do. Um, but in terms of my writing, uh, I don't think I've ever stayed, stayed the same writer. Um, it, it's, it's a constant, um, evolution and, and maybe devolution on occasion. It's, it, it's nonstop. Um, the person I am writing novels right now is not the person who wrote in 1999 or, you know, um, you just, you, you can't do it. Um, unless I suppose you were to, uh, find a formula and stick with it. Uh, mm -hmm. And then you begin writing kind of like uh, rote writing. And that's, that's a whole different thing. That's, that's uh, a certain type of professional commitment um, where you've tapped into a particular market and you want to uh, stay there and, um, you know, keep, keep the, the, the checks rolling in. So, you know, Edgar S. Burroughs, for example, did that with his Tarzan series. Um, and unfortunately, you know, you look at the, 
he did 24 books in that series. And this is what I grew up reading. Um, the first three novels are, are fantastic. They're very, very, I mean, they're of their time. So there's, mm -hmm. you know, um, disturbing racist elements to it and all that kind of stuff. But line by line, and in terms of structure, they are very well structured and well written novels. Um, you go to the 23rd novel, and it ain't, it ain't the same thing, you know, um, he's tired, but he's just, he's mailing it in. Yeah. Um, and I, I knew I, I never wanted to sort of fall into to that notion of um, uh, writing what people have seen before. And mm -hmm. I, I recognize the value of it in the sense that they will buy your book because, you know, they've read it before in a sense. And, um, and there's something that's immensely comforting, uh, I guess, in that familiarity uh, that the reader then can, can fall into, mm -hmm. um, which is really nice. But it, it, it's something I did not want to do. And, you know, even for the 10 book series, uh, the Malazan series, um, I didn't want the 10 books to be identical to each other. I, I wanted them to be very different. Um, and so rather than fight the fact that as, as a writer, you are constantly changing, you are a different writer today than you were yesterday. Um, and rather than fight that, um, I just decided to, to, to actually um, embrace it and, and, and let myself, um, whatever, whatever the voice is this day is, is the voice that I'm going to have to run with and, mm -hmm. and rather than fight it. So that probably dictated to some extent the shifts in points of view and the different voices that appear in my books. Um, because some days, yeah, that's the voice I, I, I'm on board with. And other days, it's a different voice. But stylistically, yeah, uh, you decide the style. Um, I think within the first chapter, mm -hmm. if you haven't pre if you haven't already decided what you're going to write uh, stylistically, um, and then that has its own internal rules, and, and you stay with that for sure. Mm. I got you. How has your experience as an archaeologist and anthropologist affected your writing process as far as like world building and adding layers to your stories? Well, um, in some ways, both figuratively and literally, um, you know, archaeology is all about uncovering layers and, and writing in many ways is about um, depositing layers uh, one upon another, uh, knowing what's underneath. Um, and then um, that way you kind of, you build up uh, a good foundation um, to the story you're telling. So structurally, it, it, they're very similar, just reversed mindsets. Um, and the imagination that you have to put to, put to work as an archeologist um, turned out to be very useful because if you're walking out to an area that, that you're, you're looking for a site, you're looking for evidence of um, previous occupation or, or activity, human activity uh, in an area, uh, you have to engage your imagination because you have to look at that environment now and say, well, what did it look like 10,000 years ago? What, what was that play? What was that work? Um, what was the climate like? Where were the you know drainage patterns? You know how much water was there? You know um, what kind of trees, what kind of forests, what kind of animals? And then picturing all that in your mind, you then you know grab your shovel and head to where you would camp if you were there. And you know nine times out of ten, you find a site. Um, so it's all about um, engaging the imagination and world building. Literally, as you stand there, you're world building. Um, because you're peeling back in time uh, the environment that you're looking at and, and looking at causal effect, cause and effect and, and um, sort of painting new environments on top of, uh, or rather underneath what you're seeing right now. And so if you think of a, a novel where, a fantasy novel where you're gonna open a scene, that's the equivalent of standing there when you first get out of the truck and you're looking at the place and you're scanning and you're looking around and you're noticing details. Um, that's how you build a scene in, 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 in fiction. 
Um, and then it's just a process of uh, recognizing that there are things hiding underneath the surface. Um, and then you slowly reveal that stuff. So you begin to excavate, if you will. And that's what takes you through the novel. I got Trump. Um, so Malazan started out as a role-playing game and expanded into the epic series that it is today. What was the inspiration to start writing such a collaborative world? Uh, frustration. Um, <laughs> we tried, uh, we'd been gaming a lot, uh, Cam and I, he's also an uh, archaeologist, anthropologist. Um, so we'd worked on, we'd met on a dig and we uh, worked on digs. Um, but then he went into writing as well at the same university as me. So we were roommates uh, here in Victoria. And both of us are pretty fast writers. So we'd get our assignments out of the way quickly and then we just start gaming. Um, and it was basically one-on-one -on -one gaming. So narrative was essential to this. Um, and we'd each roll up multiple characters and you know we'd alternate who was running the game. And so you had two imaginations, two mindsets um, plugging into the same setting. And, and that just sort of created a, a synergy that obviously would not be there if it was just one of us creating this stuff. Um, because my, Cam thinks very differently than I do. And, um, and yet we were able to sort of um, build on each other's sort of inventions and creations. So it was a, it was a very, very interesting process, I guess. But it was mostly done for laughs. You know, we, we were having fun. Um, and I guess that's sort of where uh, the idea of, you know, we looked at all our notes, all the maps, everything else that was there. And, and we're thinking, well, is this all just, you know, adolescent or late adolescent um, waste of time? Uh, you know, and then when I say late adolescent, I'm, I'm dragging the adolescents into the, our 20s. Um, you know, is it all just a waste of time? Was it just a hobby, um, stuff we were messing around with? But of course, we were both in a writing program, and part of the writing program included things like um, there wasn't anything on screenplay writing, but there was uh, drama, for example, mm. uh, so stage play stuff. And I was taking film studies at, uh, as my minor in this degree, and um, we just shifted to well, why don't we try to, you know, do some uh, film scripts. And so we ended up writing Gardens of the Moon um, was our first film script. And it's not the entire novel that you see. It's the, it's everything that happens in Darujistan, the assassin war on the rooftops. And um, then the fourth part, or I think the final part of, of, the, of the novel is, is what was our film script, which has again been lost. We don't know where it is. So we, yeah, we started out of um, writing uh, as film scripts and we had done some other ones. We'd done a, a horror comedy that we were then told nobody can do horror comedy. You can't put those two genres together. So we, we, were, we were getting frustrated in, in uh, trying to get into the film market. Um, we'd had scripts that were optioned two, three times in a row and, and you know, Canada is kind of horrible when it comes to funding for films and mm. anything that sort of steps outside um, the conventions of what constituted Canadian films um, just did not, could not get purchase. It could not, could not get any grounding. And, and ironically, the great stuff coming out of Canada was all coming out of Quebec because Quebec understood the value of its own culture and really funded these things well. And so even to this day, uh, if you want to go on a Netflix and watch some great Canadian films, go to the, go to the Quebecois, go to the French ones and, and suffer through the, the, you know, the subtitles or whatever, because there's great stuff coming out of Quebec now. Um, rest of Canada, not so much. So, you know, and so we were just frustrated. Um, and we just decided, okay, well, let's just break up the history that we've gamed and you know can take some areas and i take other areas let's just write them as novels and mm. get it over with get it over with <laughs> yeah you know they just turn it into this giant series no big deal you know <laughs> well we didn't i mean that's part of the ambition but we certainly didn't 
expect you know right. this to really happen um it took me eight years to finally get a publisher for gardens of the moon and basically i had to move to england in order to do it so mm. um so I, I, in some respects even at that point um we'd both kind of given up um but i'd sold this contemporary fiction novel uh this river awakens and I had Gardens of the Moon sitting there and uh, I wanted something else to do. So I had the agent finally. And um, so I thought, all right, let's, let's revamp this thing, uh, you know, dust it off and um, clean it up a bit and get it out there. Uh, just as something to deliver to the, to the agent um, mm -hmm. as a follow-up on, on my previous book. And, um, and that's, that's kind of how, to, how, how it all started. And, Cam, and meanwhile, was teaching English in, I don't know, Japan, maybe, um, Thailand, um, and was in a PhD program um, in English literature. So, yeah, he had kind of set it all aside as well. Um, so it was right on that edge of just being the thing that you did at university. And you just, you know, you grew up at that point and put it aside. And, and that was that. And get on mm. with your life. We, it got very close to, to sort of dying dying an early death because mm. of that but uh i got lucky in getting a very good uh editor who really liked gardens and uh was in there it turns out for the long haul and is still my editor in the uk so yeah very fortunate in that respect yeah so i'm curious what what made y'all decide to split the world up instead of maybe even doing like like co-writing it um well, well we co-wrote scripts but we co-wrote it in a way that we were we would sit opposite each other in a cafe or a bar or a restaurant with a, a notepad and pencil um and we would just you know slide the slide the notepad back and forth when you know your hand got tired from writing you just handed it over to to cam and then he would get you know he'd be working on it and so as as he's writing the stuff we're working out the other person sitting there thinking ahead to the next scenes and where we have to go with this and you know dialogue and that kind of stuff and then you hammer out the dialogue as you write it um so it was very much uh, an in-person engagement uh in the process but once the novel writing started well that novel uh, or fiction writing to me and i'm sure for cam as well it's a very solitary pursuit um it doesn't have the same sort of adrenaline uh push that you can get from co-writing a like a film script or something mm -hmm. and script and film scripts are fast i mean you get through them really quickly whereas novels not so much right. so uh with cam living elsewhere um we didn't have we didn't have that sort of opportunity of just and i can't even imagine how you would do it um you know it's not like you could they didn't even have laptops back then if they did they were like 20 pound laptops so right and the batteries would die instantly and all the rest and most cafes did not have places you could plug things into so i said yeah. i also guess like you know with like the time difference and and so forth like that you know it, it'd be hard to get yeah. you know i guess not necessarily edits but like okay here's my next chapter you know something yeah, like that yeah yeah and I've, I've talked to people who've co-written uh, i know a lot of people who co-write and yeah, they kind of do it that way. They mm -hmm. they uh, alternate, they may alternate chapters, or some will take certain ser certain characters, and some will take the other characters. Uh, someone will come up with a story idea, and the other person does most of the writing. You know, it, it, there's different processes. Mm -hmm. um, but both Cam and I were kind of cagey. We did not want. We never wanted to farm out. You know, in, in any sense. Um, the, not just the stories or the world, but the scenes we were writing um we wanted to put our own stamp on on those scenes mm. so it just it made sense to uh split the world up and the, there are aspects that cam was interested in um that i wasn't um, mm. but i knew they needed to be there and, and vice versa so you know we just took it took it that way but as they start like a pro con list but like okay i want this this and this and you can have these <laughs> yeah and very much so um you know um because we were both running games so uh it wasn't a case of these were these areas 
of the Malaysian world were CAMS games, and these are mine. That's not the dividing point. Mm-hmm. It was Cam said, well, I, I want to write more about the Crimson Guard. Mm-hmm. And I said, okay, I want to write about the, the Malaysian Marines. And that's kind of how it sort of broke its way up. I got you. Um, so your books can have like any person at any time have a point of view, and it can definitely be jarring for new readers. Uh, what was the thought process behind that? Um, well, you've read Clancy, haven't you, Tom Clancy? Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's a common thing to do in, in that in that genre. Uh, you you jump points of view all over the place. He's he's got the one. It's the one novel that that's the sort of the Third World War one. Do you know that one? The title's not. It's, it's no? leaving me. <laughs> yeah. Um, and of course, he had to jump to characters all over the all over the planet mm-hmm. uh, on both sides of the conflict. And so that never struck me as as in any way unusual Mm -hmm. um to switch points of view and so i guess uh yeah it never occurred to me that it would be problematic um the challenge as a writer is can you can you create points of view that are distinct enough Mm. so that they can be differentiated and that comes down to characterization and and tone and, and that kind of thing um and if you're tying it if you're tying your narrative tightly to a point of view for a particular section um yeah you have to alter the rhythm uh, of the actual sentence structure and uh make changes to the diction as well diction levels depending on the character Mm. um and so that that allowed for uh enough uh variation uh in the narrative to hopefully not um bog everybody down in, in a kind of a monochromatic um, droning narrative um, that that you know swaps out character names but otherwise does not change in its style or its approach so these are very tight third person points of view so quite often sitting on the shoulder sometimes popping into the heads of that character and that establishes their own internal voice rhythms and then that rhythm of the internal thinking of the character spills out into the rhythm of their section and so their section then becomes unique and then you go to the next one um so for the writing process what makes that useful is uh you don't get tired of your own uh of your own writing if you will because you're altering it all the time and changing it up um and keeping it interesting in that fashion so yeah but i say i know you even mentioned earlier you know kind of depending on the day you know, your characters can have a different voice not know. entirely yeah i was being not somewhat oh. <laughs> lazy describing that um <laughs> no i mean what happens is my re- my writing process is the stuff i wrote yesterday is the first thing i look at mm. and i do an edit um and in the process of doing that edit i pick up on on the rhythm and voice established in that previous day and then I can run with it if I'm staying mm. with that scene. Um, but if I end a scene, um, that's when I want to make the shift. And uh, so I have to be conscious of it. It's not. And what I was trying to indicate was that all kinds of things can affect your writing process any day, right? You, the discipline part is simply showing up and sitting down to work. Um, but all kinds of things, you know, the mood you're in when you got up in the morning, you know, how well you slept, um, uh, you know, did that car just nearly run you over as you tried to cross the street, you know, all of these things are going to affect um, your mindset. And the discipline part is simply to sit down and, and acknowledge all of that, and that it's going to have an effect, and then be mindful um, that you're not the same writer you were yesterday. Mm-hmm. But it's okay because you know the variation is probably something only you will notice. Mm. Um, but don't fight it because it's 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 just that's the nature of the beast. Gotcha. So I know uh, you frequent Facebook and talk to a lot of your readers, and you do Reddit uh, AMAs and so forth. Did you did you ever expect or you any ever expect Malazan to be as big as it is? You know, you 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 turn a corner in a different fantasy Facebook group or Reddit community and Malazan is there somewhere. Like it's always in the forefront. 
you know, what was that ever expected or was there like a point where you no, were no like, okay, never... now I expect it. <laughs> no, how, well, I mean, how, how could we, you know, when we started, there really was no internet in the fashion it is now. Mm -hmm. uh, it was not ubiquitous. Um, I remember in, when it's, when it was starting up uh, in the UK, I was working at uh, Toyota, the head office there in accessories department. Um, and we were told not to not to go online because everything was tied into in the UK into uh, the phone lines. So uh, you were charged by the minute mm. to go online. And so there was a huge aversion to just the, even the idea of doing this. Um, so no, we, there was no way we could anticipate um, the whole uh, evolution of social media. I mean, that, that's, that's a whole, whole new thing. Um, and of course, writers who are, are emerging now uh, are embracing that because they've grown up with it. Um, so it's always jarring for us. You know, you mentioned me on Reddit. I think I've only done it twice. And I think there was about a 10 year break in between. So, you know, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not something I, I do regularly. Mm -hmm. um, the, this kind of interview, like what we're doing, that seems to be, that's become more prevalent. Um, Zoom has made, made a huge difference, I think. Mm -hmm. um, Skype before that, I guess. Um, so no, there was no way we could anticipate any of it. Um, and I mean, my sense these days is, is, I mean, I don't know, is Malaz, the Malazan world, the Malazan fiction, it's sort of a, at a mid-level. Uh, it's certainly not at the level of uh, uh, Martin or Brandon Sanderson or, or anything along those lines. And it often, uh, a lot of the f uh, feedback I get, I call it fallback actually, because it seems that the Malazan books um have a big target painted on them you know within within the fandom and you know people either like it or they they just yeah you know they don't and and then they don't like the fans of it and then it's like oh man you know yeah, you, you just you just you fall down this rabbit hole like you were saying the fallback yeah yeah, yeah it's, it's one of those things you know you, you go in it's like okay i'm looking I'm looking for a new series to read and everybody is, you, know, you, you sometimes you'll get a new one, but Malazan's like, oh, it's, it's always the first one. <laughs> it's like, well, have, have you, have you read Malazan? Yeah. It's, it's, it's just so funny, you know, seeing that. And, and, yeah. But, you know, I feel, I feel like it's up there with, you know, your Martin or your Sanderson. I mean, you know, you're, I guess you're kind of in the company with like, you know, maybe Stavely, um, Abercrombie. So I thought, I know a lot of people kind of compare you with Abercrombie and I actually saw, um, I think an interview the other day of how you wrote him into a book <laughs> or oh, into yeah, a story. Yeah. <laughs> well, he's uh, yeah, he posted it was a while back. Um, he posted a picture of I guess he was doing a book signing in the UK, and somebody brought him Gardens of the Moon and he signed it. <laughs> you know, so, so I thought, oh, you twat. Anyway, so anyways, um, I like Joe a lot, so uh, I, I decided to fire back in the best way I could, which was uh, to create a character uh, in in a novella. And then do horrible things to him. So nothing at all wrong with that. <laughs> no, absolutely not. And you know, of course, it, it's it's a firing across the bow. And I'm sure if he's inclined, I mean, he can certainly do the same back. And that would be a lot of fun. Okay. So um, the God is not willing is the first tale of witness. Uh, can you tell the audience a little bit about what they can expect in this new new novel and sequel trilogy? Sure. Um, I've talked to some people and. There seems to be, I guess, a fair consensus that you can read this um, having not read the 10 books or Cam's books or, or anything of, you know, that we've done. And I, I'm hoping that that's the case. I'm hoping that new readers can come to it. Um, it basically takes place 10 years after um, the events of The Crippled God, the final book of the 10 book series. Um, and it, uh, in terms of setting, it, it's for, for readers of the series, it's a familiar setting. So we're, we're coming back to a place. And it's kind of dealing with the legacy of what various characters were up to in the 10 book series. But it's, it's their legacy in the sense of it sits behind the story. The story itself is, um, 
uh, I think self-contained and the characters are um, for this book primarily. They're, they're not, it's not a case of, you know, all these old characters that um, were there in the, the original series are suddenly all back and then you're, you're left with uh, almost dependent and being reliant upon the readers knowing who these characters are. I think it occurred to me early on that that would be a mistake. Um, so these are primarily new characters. Some have a history and some were sort of mi played minor roles in, in the 10 books, but they're 10 years older now. They're different, you know, uh, they're whole new people in a respect. So um, I think stylistically it's, uh, it's leaner. It, it's, um, it's a shorter novel. So um, it's not a doorstopper like, like the, the 10 book series. Um, and I guess, yeah, there, there, there's more, uh, uh, economy involved, um, in the writing style. And, um, but it's still, it, it touches bases on, on some of the things that, uh, I guess just, I like to write about, so they will be familiar to, to readers of my books. Um, and like I say, I, I think. I think new readers can come to it. Sure. Yeah, I, I feel like a lot of authors have done that with like a second series set in the same world is that it, it's they've allowed new readers to be able to join in and then go back and read the, you know, the first series if they, they're inclined to. I really like that kind of style choice. I know Peter B. Brett's done it. Mm -hmm. uh, Abercrombie's done it. Um, but, you know, that's kind of becoming a little, I guess, a little more prevalent with some of these uh, you know, bigger name authors that have, that have had these great selling, you know, series beforehand. Um, so that's, that's awesome to hear. So that, uh, I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of people would, in, would enjoy to hear that people that haven't been introduced to your world yet. Um, so last question I got for you, anything that you've, uh, had the opportunity to read recently that you'd recommend? Um, well, actually I've been reading a lot of nonfiction. Um, so I don't know if you want me to recommend nonfiction or not. <laughs> it's like, if you want to, why not? <laughs> way out there. Um, yeah, my interests sort of are all over the place. I'm just looking at my bookshelves right now. I'm seeing if I've got a copy of the thing that I was reading. No, uh, what, what I will mention is um, a series I stay with. Uh, and no, it's up there. Anyways, uh, a fictional series that I actually am really enjoying. Um, and that's uh, Eric Flint's, um, his alternate history. Just a sec. No, you're good. So let's do first one. Yeah, the first one's 1632. Um, are you familiar with him? Mm -mm. Uh, it's, it's an alternate history where a small American town is, is transported uh, back into, well, what would become Germany, but in the year 1632. And it's, Flint is, is a hell of a smart guy. I've never met him, but my goodness. Um, first, he knows his history, but secondly, his instincts on where to take that story, that premise. Um, were mind blowing. Mm. And yeah, he has since, there are many authors now who are participating in, in building that history, that alternate history. Um, some are good, some not so much, but it doesn't matter because the, the events are intriguing and interesting in and of themselves. But uh, I, 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 I definitely admire Eric Flint um, as a writer. He's, he's very good, smart man. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, well, Stephen, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to chat with me about your life and writing and Malazan and The God Is Not Willing. Um, so I know uh, The God Is Not Willing is actually out uh, kind of everywhere, I guess, besides the U.S. right now. I know it's uh, got a release date uh, of November 16th uh, here in the U.S. and I got pushed back a week. Uh, so everybody, you know, if you've enjoyed Malazan up to this point, definitely check out The God Is Not Willing next month when it comes out. Uh, and Stephen, we'll, uh, we'll have to do this again once, once we get to book two. All right. Sounds good. All Thank right. you again. Talk yeah. soon. Thanks for the invitation. Absolutely.